Hi, everybody. Welcome, Jacqueline. Thank you, Shaheen. It's so great to be here. It's so, so, so special to welcome you on the last day of our Inspire Ed conference, which really is the day of action. Um, mm. We started in our first few days talking about the importance of listening. The conference is different because it's brought in many, many voices and filling my heart, many students into the conversation as well. But today is really the time to think about like, how do we make it happen? And how do mm. we commit to making it happen? And I, I can't imagine a better person to be in conversation with you um, than, uh, than uh, that, Jacqueline, today. So, so welcome. Um, a quick introduction. Jacqueline doesn't really need an introduction. Um, but Jacqueline founded one of my most favorite organizations, Acumen, um, in 2001. I think Jacqueline, what strikes me about Acumen is your vision to really take on through social entrepreneurs, um, in your own words, um, the world's toughest problems um, to do with poverty. And I know through Acumen, millions and millions of lives have changed through health, through education, through clean energy. Um, and I know for someone like you, you're probably focused all the time on what more can you do? Um, but I hope you take time to stop and just feel just incredible about everything you've achieved so far. Um, couldn't be happier to have you with us. Uh, Jacqueline's just written another book called Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. Um, uh, following her first book, The Blue Sweater, which of course was a New York Times bestseller. Um, Jacqueline, so happy that you've been able to put some of your life's rich learnings um, into that second book as well. Um, I'm going to read out the next part because I couldn't keep track of all your, your, all your awards, but just, you to share to say few, just a few things for the audience in India who may not know. Um, but Jacqueline is a top 100 global thinker, um, one of the 25 smartest people of the decade, 100 greatest living minds, um, and also received the Lifetime Achievement Award for Social Entrepreneurship um, by Forbes 400. So all of that aside, Jacqueline, um, such a special human being and so happy to have you here um, for that. So we're going to launch into a conversation. Um, the topic of our conversation, Jacqueline, you've chosen so beautifully, moral leadership for imperfect times. Um, and so let's start with the first part of, of that, moral leadership. And I, I know that term probably conjures up very different things to different people. Um, to you, what, what's your personal definition of, of moral leadership? Thanks so much, Shaheen. And, and it's so exciting to be with you. Um, just watching everything that you have built with Teach for India um, shows the power of social entrepreneurship. That's who you are. And of moral leadership, which I would define as um, focused on serving others and not yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a, real, it's a real joy to be here. Um, so often when we think of the word moral, we think of righteousness. We think of a a set of rules prescribed from some higher authority. The way I look at moral in this moment of our history, when we are so interdependent and the problems are so complex, is um, a real focus on, on other people, not on the individualism that has gotten us into so many of the problems that we are in, but on the collective. And what will it actually take to build a world that not only focuses on the collective we, but does so in a way that protects the poor, the vulnerable, and the sustainability of the earth. Hmm. And, and where does that come from, Jacqueline? Uh, where does moral leadership come from? How does it get built? I think it comes from something that's inside all of us. There's a knowing what, from whatever religious tradition we were raised in, or even if it's just paying attention to the beauty of nature, that at some level, I think we have a human consciousness that understands that we are all interconnected and indeed interdependent. And if we start with that framework, Shaheen, and we insist on the, the individual and collective dignity of every single human being, no matter how terrible the circumstances into which they were born, 
that they deserve the ability to flourish, then we can build a framework on top of it. What makes it complex in this moment is that we're all part of each other's worlds and lives right now. And so it used to be easier when our religious leaders or our political leaders would give us the framework in which we would operate. The world is too complex for that. Now we have to work through competing systems. And so the only thing I can see is if we can move beyond that or maybe below or above, most importantly within, and build a framework that says every one of our families, communities, nations, organizations must be built on the, the set of principles that puts our shared humanity at the center. Um, yeah. And, and for you personally, Jacqueline, how, how did you develop um, that for yourself, that, mm. that real um, beautiful compassion for others, the ability to, to give beyond yourself and the relentless like drive to pursue that for so many years? Like where, where did that come from? Um, so, you know, I think it started you know, being raised in a, in, a, in a more religious family, a Catholic family that uh, was more social justice oriented um, in terms of uh, as Catholic families go, um, because they're all different. But mine, um, you know, I was told over and over to whom much is given, much is expected. Mm -hmm. And that was just a mantra of my youth. Mm -hmm. And then I was lucky to have in public school um, a teacher when I was 10 uh, who really encouraged me to look at other women leaders. Uh, and there weren't very many in my generation to look at. Most of them were dead, in fact. But I was just, I marveled at what individuals could do. Um, and then as I got older, Shaheen, well, obviously growing up with my parents' influence, but as I got older and saw the world, starting off on Wall Street, seeing the power of the marketplace, and yet in Brazil, in Colombia, seeing how poor people who were so vibrant, who had such opportunity, uh, or rather uh, such capability, were left out. And it made no sense to me mm -hmm. if we were truly going to live in this world where everyone was equal. And that was the beginning, I think, of the journey for me. Yeah, I mean, resonates so, so deeply, Jacqueline, as a as a child, my parents kept bringing us back to India um, for our vacations. Um, and I remember always like flying into Bombay and flying over the massive slum and landing and, and seeing the, the huge sprawling urban slum communities and right at their footstep, um, the skyscrapers and just just asking myself how why you know and what did I do to deserve this and that um, yeah deeply deeply resonates um, let's start I guess with the future and go go back a little bit I think it's it's hard to do a conversation without talking about the impact of the, the crazy times we live in in the last six months and what the post pandemic world has meant but I'm I'm curious Jacqueline. Um, what sort of insights have you had during this time? What, what implications has it had on the way you think on your, your own leadership? What has really the last six months looked like for you? Um, in a way, Shane, I think it's taught me that you know, Acumen was born in crisis and that in our darkest times, we have the chance to find our best selves. Yeah. I have seen extraordinary human compassion, innovation, and what I would call the great pivot. Um, social entrepreneurs are, are probably better at this than almost anybody else, yeah. because we see every problem as an opportunity. What has been thrilling to me in these past six months, despite the extraordinary loss and hardship that we also experienced as a world, is to see um, is to see some of the Acumen Fellows just change their business model um, overnight, is to see people in our community that have financial means provide us with emergency funds so that Acumen could make grants for the first time and help these organizations 
actually go through. And that actually helped us get more proximate, even though we were sitting in our homes, because we got to, not got to, we had to recognize the, the, the sheer inequality of how people were experiencing this pandemic. And I think that created a, a great and fierce urgency of this moment and that we're all needed to get through it. Yeah, I love that, the, the fierce urgency of the moment. Um, so beautiful. When, I mean, as someone who probably has had closer proximity to social entrepreneurs than, than anybody else, um, and, and you must have just seen the most extraordinary acts of human compassion, persistence, grit in the, in the acumen entrepreneurs. Um, can you maybe share a, a story um, of one that is close to your, your heart? I know it's, it's an almost impossible question to pick one, uh, but, but a, a story maybe for these times, someone that really stands out. Like you said, Shaheen, they're so amazing. Um, but I'm going to go, I'm going to send two because one is really big and I know there are so many young people on this call, but yeah. if we're thinking about the future and the importance of holding on to relationship and community as we grow, um, it's a story of community. It's a story of capital. It's a story of bringing resource, whatever resources are needed to bear on a problem. And it, it starts with a woman named Gayatri Vasudevan from Bangalore. She has a company called LaborNet, where they've trained now a million um, construction workers, beauty salon women, um, laborers, uh, not just in vocational training, but in critical thinking, lifelong learning. And they were actually training one lakh people um, at, the day, uh, at the time of lockdown. So she called me and said, Jacqueline, we're going to have 100,000 people thousands of miles away from their homes. They've already been paid. You know, I have to pivot. You should talk about a pivot. And Shaheen, I watched Gayatri just make the decision that she was going to find a way to shelter and feed all of these migrant workers until she could help them get to the next stage. We then, something we'd never done before, could reach out to everyone we knew because she needed to raise a million dollars mm -hmm. uh, just to keep people really alive. Um, it had very little to do with the business and everything to do with the social enterprise because of the loyalty, the trust, and the learning that she was doing in that period. So that was probably the most just stunning shift. And now she's, then she started working with government um, to really change her overall model. Um, I couldn't be prouder to know someone like her. Um, so Hani Mohan, uh, right in uh, Mumbai, she had a company that um, manufactured sanitary napkins for low-income women. And um, when lockdown first happened in India, sanitary napkins were not considered an essential product. So wonder who, you know, gender and the policymakers. But um, I saw Sohani as well just change. And she decided that, one, she had to go straight to the policymakers and and get that shifted, which she did. Equally, she couldn't, you know, she couldn't manufacture these when people were home, but she also couldn't bear losing the jobs. And mm -hmm. so um, one of her colleagues worked at Mahindra and somehow got to Anant Mahindra, and this is about privilege, right, mm -hmm. access, um, convinced him to give them a fact, one of their, factories that were now no longer operating. And of course, then the company got excited and they helped retool the machines so that the women could make masks. This was you know, within the first two weeks of lockdown in mm -hmm. India. And we just watched her shift. And the, the story for me there is we're having these conversations about markets are bad or government is responsible or we need the only civil society. We need all of us and the most successful social entrepreneurs in this period of the pandemic have moved quickly, not worried about the kind of capital, but mm -hmm. used whatever capital was needed and partnered 
with government, with corporations, with civil society. And, um, and those are just two of, we've made a hundred, almost, we've made about 90 grants, 90 companies. And I've just watched business models shift in a way that I think could help us rethink how we do, how we deliver services uh, to low income people um, around the world. Just amazing and just themes of this mindset of opportunity and positivity and partnership and collaboration um, and such extreme compassion, right? I just have to keep going. Whatever I, I, I aim to do, I need to do it even more in a I'm time. I'm focused on my, my North Star. I'm not focused on me. I'm focused yeah. on my North Star and I am going to do whatever it takes. And it is exactly what you say. It's what you do. Yeah. Jacqueline, if you, you zoom out from these two examples and really think about your, your journey, I'm going to ask you an impossible question um, to answer, which is really, uh, you know, you're, you're addressing right now um, hundreds and, and thousands of people actually on this call that are really committed to changing education. Um, and they are leaders in education or they're leaders from the outside who want to shape education. Um, what, what have you learned about leadership and what it takes to build it um, from your incredibly rich journey? I warned you it was a hard question, but. Um, I would say um, it, it sounds obvious, um, Shaheen, but the first is just start and let the work teach you. So many of us want to lead, we want to give, and we um, are waiting for a real understanding of our purpose, or um, we live provisionally, and we think, well, as soon as I get my MBA, then I'll start. And yeah. um, I would say, just start. Let the work teach you. Use your curiosity, follow the thread. The second big lesson for me, um, particularly in the early years, and I don't say just start, lightly. I know that some of the hardest conversations a young person has, has to have is with their parents um, when you're doing something that sounds crazy or hard for them because they want to keep you safe. And so just starting uh, isn't easy. And so that I would say is the, that's what really separates. Just start and then stick with it. Make a commitment to something bigger than yourself and it will set you free. Um, because we think that when we're starting, and I don't know about you with Teach for India, but I felt like this with Acumen. I'm really going to give this three years and see what happens. And now I'm about to celebrate 20 years, and I feel like I'm just getting started again. The second is yeah. if you rule out failure, you rule out success. That especially in the early years, it is inevitable that you will fail. What separates those who make change in the world and those who talk about it um, is really the courage to fall down, make mistakes, and most importantly, get up and keep going. And I would say the next one is to accompany each other. Um, accompaniment is a Jesuit term that means to walk beside. And we use it with our, our, our fellows. I mean, we use it with, with our companies, with our fellows. You know, how does Acumen actually accompany our entrepreneurs? But the truth is we have to accompany each other. We have to have a cohort of people around us who will hold us in the dark mm -hmm. times because this work is hard, um, mm -hmm. but also to celebrate the good times. Uh, so much richness in these ideas, Jacqueline. Um, you know, in, in today's world, there is so much stress on our well-being, mm. uh, and yet there are these larger-than-life problems that need to be solved. And as you said, the work is hard, and it's difficult, and it takes time, um, lots of time. Um, can you share, like, what you've personally done to, to stay on the path? Like, what's really helped you really maintain this incredible, like, just incredible energy for... Um, for your work, for the vision of, of Acumen, and just for the vision of a better world. Mm, thanks, Shaheen. For some reason, it makes me emotional um, because it is, this work is hard. And it's a, life, it's a life that is focused on doing the hard. 
And there are times um, when you think, why, why am I doing this? Um, but the part that I, that no one told me when we were starting, when I was starting out 35 years ago, which is, I'm, I'm sure for many young people feels like it may as well just be forever, um, is that at every step of the way, if you are awake to it, there's beauty to be found. Mm. I, um, I've really come to see beauty as the urge to life. You can see it in any village or slum um, where a woman might put geraniums in a coffee pot. Women wear the most beautiful colors in the, in the meanest, cruelest places. I think as human beings, we, we find that. Now, everyone defines beauty differently. Um, I'm a, a much more visual person. And so for me, it's this remembrance at how hard this work can be. For me, it's, it's the visual of seeing beauty, but it's also the connection that I feel with another human being who has nothing and yet has more than so many uh, of the privileged people that I know. And that, that the richness that I feel in those interactions, in those connections. Um, when I can't do that, I read poetry in the mornings. I go on runs, I connect to nature. Uh, so many, I guess, rituals now. Mm. Not when I was young, I wouldn't have thought of them that way. <laughs> as an older person. Rituals that connect me to what we talked about at the very beginning, this moral framework that, um, reminds me that we are part of each other and that we will only survive and thrive when all of us do, truly. And um, that keeps me going and it keeps me feeling not only full, but so lucky to be doing this work. Mm. Yeah, so beautiful. So Does beautiful. it resonate with you, Shaheen? Very much resonates. And uh, I was thinking as I was listening to there is a quality in the way that you share, which feels very poetic. Um, mm. I, I'm, I'm just, it's beautiful to hear that you're connected to poetry and to nature and to beauty. And I think that that deeply resonates with me as well, very deeply resonates. Um, Jacqueline, just turning to uh, Given Inspired is, is, is really a lot about school education. Um, a question on how you build some of this in, in children, and I know a lot of your work has been with social entrepreneurs, but if you were to infuse anything into the school system, the education system, to create the next generation of people who are connected and compassionate, what would you do? What would you focus on? What would your message to educators be? Mm. It's funny that you asked that, Shaheen. In fact, Acumen just launched Acumen Academy in, um, in May uh, during the pandemic, which is the World School for Social Change. Um, it's, it's online, as well as our fellows that you know, and it's exciting that we have so many Teach for India fellows as part of our fellowship. And the, the theory behind it is too many of our, our universities, our schools, uh, focus only on content. But if we're going to solve the, pro the diff most difficult problems of our time, we need to focus on character as well. And by character, I mean so many of the principles that I write about in the book. Deep listening, understanding um, identity, not from a place of dividing each other, but from a place of connecting to one another, telling stories that matter. Importantly, learning to hold um, opposing truths and even values, intention. Um, these are not things we are seeing in our leaders, uh, at, and certainly in our political world or our corporate world. This is not things we are taught in school. And yet these are the new hard skills. So your question is actually something I've been thinking about and at some point we should really talk about mm -hmm. is how then, if we, if we were learning how to embed this at the university level, we build our moral compasses when we're little. I was six. And so how do we 
bring these same ideas into our elementary schools, into all of our schools, because it's, we no longer can rely just on parents. We need to embed these principles in, into all of our institutions. And so that's something that's very much on my mind. These are, these are not complex concepts, but they are hard to live. And, yeah. and so we need to develop these practices in our children from early on. Yeah. Oh, Jackson, there's so much more to talk about, but I think we're out of time. Is there, is there any last thing that, that you would very much like to share at this point? Shaheen, the only thing I would like to share um, is how moved I am by this next generation of change makers, as I know you are, that, um, People often ask me, you know, how is the next generation di different? And I find it almost trite to be looking at big generations and making generalizations. On the other hand, if there were one difference that I see, um, besides the fact that the next generation is smarter, more connected, and <laughs> understands the complexity of the problems much better than my generation did, it is that we no longer have a generation like we had in my lifetime where you had those who went into business and those who wanted to do good. Um, all young people want to be used right now to work on our toughest problems and we need them. And they don't want to do it from a place of doing good alone. There is a challenge and an intellectual rigor um, that comes from working on the hardest issues of our time. And so the next generation gives me great hope from that perspective. And I would end where we went to with beauty in some ways. This is not an easy path. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't know anything in my life that is of deep, deep value that was easy. It is in the embracing the difficult that we find our best selves, that we find our deepest joy and we find meaning. Um, it doesn't come to us sitting at the sidelines or waiting at the, at the starting blocks. It comes by going step by step, building brick by brick and asking the hard questions until finally we find ourselves in a place where we can actually move the world. Jacqueline, thank you so much. I, I, I scribbled like a page of notes while I was, while I was, <laughs> what I could remember um, but I, I think this, this idea of if you awake to it, you said there is beauty around um, and you shared the, the urge to light. I thought those three words were incredibly powerful and beautiful. I'm feeling so um, full at the end of this conversation and at the end of this week of, of Inspire Ed. Um, thank you so much, Jacqueline, for being with us. Shaheen, thank you for all you do, the courage, the compassion, the conviction, um, all the C's that you bring to, to the world. And, um, and huge thanks to every person uh, listening. I wish we could be there in person, yeah. um, in a big room, but the, the, it's exciting that the technology allows us to be together um, wherever we are in the world, because we need every single one of us. Thank you, Shaheen. Thank you, Jacqueline.